Hello and welcome everyone. I hope you're well. Welcome to the world's first webinar about recovered carbon black in plastic color concentrates. My name is Martin von Wolfersdorf and I will be your host and presenter today. So let's head over to PowerPoint and start the presentation. A little bit about me. I spent 14 years in the world of titanium dioxide white pigments where I developed two of the uh, high performance master batch pigments for Huntsman. Uh, I then worked in the custom color master batch industry with Americam uh, and served markets like turf and automotive interiors. And then I worked in carbon black with Cabot where I was responsible for the sales of rubber blacks in uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa. Since 2014, I work as a global agency for strategy and marketing of chemicals, and I do business scouting, growth hacking, uh, and you might know I'm specializing in recovered carbon black. Yay! These are some of my reference clients, but let's look at general tire recycling processes. Uh, today, we talk about recovered carbon black, so we're talking about the pyrolysis tire recycling process. There are other processes uh, that also produce valuable materials, but today's webinar is about recovered carbon black in plastics. This is the uh, agenda for today. I will first start to look at uh, recovered carbon black, the state of technology and availability, uh, then we will look at plastic color concentrates and recovered carbon black in color concentrates as a third part. These are some of the participants today. I'm very happy to see that there is quite a few master batch companies, uh, quite a few recovered carbon black producers, one carbon black producer, some machine producers, and also a couple of service companies and consultants. I would like to do a special welcome to Francois Terrat at Pro2Act, who is my mentor and who brought me to the topic of recovered calm black. And also a special welcome to Jean-Paul Boissier, who has a um, long time developed uh, recovered carbon black within the ETRA Pyrolysis Forum. Welcome all. So let's talk about recovered calm black and the state of technology. So how is recovered carbon black produced? It's produced by pyrolysis, which is a depolymerization at heat between 400 and 1000 degrees Celsius in an inert atmosphere. Many companies are using nitrogen. Some companies are using steam. And we're producing about 10% of a hydrocarbon gas, which is used for the on-site energy creation. We get about 45% of a hydrocarbon oil, which can be sold as a combustible or even in the material valorization applications. And we get about 33% recovered carbon black. This is the profit center. And of course, this is the topic of this presentation. If you use whole tires, we also get 12% steel, which can be sold in the, the uh, recycled steel markets. So what is recovered carbon black? It's important to know recovered carbon black is a composite of four material groups. Of course, we are recovering a mixture of the carbon blacks. There we have to see that tires um, consist of several carbon blacks. Each tire section and tires are uh, built up of between 10 and 14 sections. Each section contains its own carbon blacks and its own rubber polymers and additives. So we might recover 200 and 300 types of carbon blacks from the tread. We might recover 300 and 500 types of carbon blacks from the sidewall, 600 and other semi-reinforcing carbon blacks from the carcass. This is of course what we want to recover and uh, it's important to say feedstock control is very important to the quality of recovered carbon black. The three other groups we get, I call them a payload because uh, we get them um, because these materials are also in the tire or are produced by the process. The second group is the uh, group of inorganics, also called ash. This could be amorphous silica from the uh, fillers in the tread. In Europe, there is a lot of silica filler in the tread. Uh, it could also be crystalline silica. This is not so good. Um, this could come from sand in the uh, profile of the tire. So we have to clean the tires not to have the crystalline sand because when we mill the recovered carbon black to below 10 micron, this will become respirable 
uh, crystalline silica, uh, which is um, considered a, a dangerous material. The same, uh, we get zinc in the form of zinc sulfate. Uh, zinc oxide is put in the rubber uh, compound as a vulcanization activator. There should not be zinc oxide in the recovered carbon black because zinc oxide is a dangerous good with high ecotoxicity. And if we had zinc oxide in the recovered carbon black, we would have to declare this on the safety data sheet and uh, with uh, kind of ugly looking uh, labels on the, the packaging. Zinc sulfide uh, should be in the recovered carbon black, not zinc oxide. And we get of this, depending on the feedstock, whether we have car tires or truck tires, 15 to 20 percent uh, ash content. 15 percent in the case of truck tires and 20 or even higher than 20 percent in the case of passenger car tires. And this is, as the composition of the carbon blacks, this is depending on the feedstock. Now we get to other groups of materials, and these come from the depolymerized rubber polymer. They could be volatiles, organic volatiles on the recovered carbon black. This is also not good uh, because it doesn't uh, pick up the uh, chance, the opportunity of value creation of having a low PAH content. PAH are the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And uh, you might know that, um, first of all, the industry demands a very low content of PAH, but also the type of virgin carbon blacks that have low PAH content are much more expensive than the normal carbon blacks. So here we can create value with a very low PAH content. For that, we need a low total content of volatile hydrocarbons. So I'm saying 0 to 3%. 3% uh, is the maximum we can bear. We, bearing in mind that we might have 1%, 1.5% of uh, moisture. The rest, if it is aliphatic hydrocarbons, this is good, but they shouldn't be aromatic, and we need to analyze that. The fourth component is also process depending. And the fourth component is if we have volatile hydrocarbons and the residence time of the process, for example, in a batch process, is very long, uh, this can actually solidify. And uh, now in coloring applications, this could be a, a nice benefit because we'll see a little bit later on the carbon content of the recovered carbon black is very important for uh, delivering the black color. In the rubber, um, this chow of carbonaceous residues of fresh carbon is not so good. So generally, I would say if we can reduce the amount of fresh carbon, uh, we should. Now let's look at how different uh, uh, carbon blacks and recovered carbon blacks look like. The important information about carbon black is there's microparticles in the size between 20 microns and about 100 microns. 20 microns in the case of uh, 100 great carbon black and, um, uh, and uh, 100 micron in the case of uh, 700 range ASTM carbon blacks. Now, um, you see the microparticles. These microparticles, uh, nano-sized microparticles, are never alone. They are clustered into aggregates, and these aggregates are fused together at about 1,700 degrees. This is the smallest version of the carbon black we can uh, have in any kind of system. The size is 0.05 micron to 0.5 micron so very small and the aggregate size distribution is very important for the performance in tinting and uh, coloring. Now there's agglomerates, uh, they could be several aggregates clustering together with van der Waals forces, they could have any size between 1 micron and 100 micron. And uh, in some applications like rubber extrusion, uh, the grit is very important. Grit can come from oversized particles coming from the quenching water or the pelletizing water. And uh, this typically has the size of 125 micron. So there is a special rubber extrusion carbon black grades that are using uh, demineralized water for uh, quenching and pelletizing to avoid the assaults. Also, typically carbon blacks are unmilled or they're um, coarsely hammer milled. Now let's look at a recovered carbon black. Recovered carbon black contains carbon blacks which are recovered. So it can be a kiniform, grade like it can be have it can have the structure similar as uh, carbon black. Uh, 
The microparticles are quite different though, because here we have heterogeneous material. It's not only carbon black. We have the ash content, we have uh, carbonaceous residues, we might have some volatiles. And the microparticles are anything between 20 nanometers, which is the, the smallest size of the carbon black, and 500 nanometers, which could be bigger particles of uh, the ash content. We also have aggregates. However, here in the pyrolysis, we don't have the high temperatures of the carbon black manufacturing reactor. We have temperatures maybe between 350 and on the upper side at uh, 700 uh, degrees Celsius. Now we have a very large aggregate size between about one micron and one millimeter or even several millimeters. So there is a need of milling for recovered carbon black. And the milling should in any case be below 100 micron. Um, it's very difficult to have any performance in rubbers and plastics for recovered carbon black that is unmilled and might be much bigger than uh, 100 micron. A really good uh, or standard quality um, recovered carbon black might be below 45 micron. Um, for plastics and coloring, I really uh, recommend finer mi uh, milling, which could be 20 micron. We will get to the specification for coloring recovered carbon black in a moment. In some cases, actually, um, producers of recovered carbon black are milling to below 2 micron. This is the case for uh, very low viscosity systems, for example, if you want to use recovered carbon black as color in paints or inks. So let's look at a specification for coloring applications. At first, it is important to know, and this also comes on the uh, safety data sheets, the model mixture of recovered carbon black is carbon black, silica, and zinc sulfate. So in the carbon black can be anything between 80 and 90%. Uh, this is feedstock depending, as we discussed before. It can be 3 to 10% silica, or even slightly higher than 10% if we have a very high content, uh, silica content feedstock. Zinc sulfate could be 6 to 10%, for example. Now, the most important property is the consistency. At the moment, uh, at this time, there is no confirmed testing method uh, from ASTM. Uh, you might know ASTM has a workgroup D36 that is working on <clears throat> norms and specifications for recovered carbon black. So at the moment, the um, exact specification of the consistency is pending. However, in my opinion, consistency should start with a consistent TGA result. TGA is a thermogravimetric analysis, and it analyzes how much volatiles you have, um, how much carbon, and how much ash in, uh, in the feedstock. Uh, sorry, in the recovered carbon black. We can adapt the method ISO 9924 part 2 uh, for the TGA, measuring the consistency. If we don't have a consistent TGA result, it's very difficult to have consistent application results. Now, the carbon comes from the TGA, the ash comes from the TGA. I would recommend having more than 82% carbon for a coloring recovered carbon black, which means the ash content should be less than 15%. Of course, if you can have a recovered carbon black that has no ash content, that would be even better. Carbon char might be between 3 and 22%. We'll get back to the carbon char uh, in one of the next slides. This is depending on the feedstock, on the process type, but also on the process conditions. The total volatiles should be 1 to 1.5%, 1 meaning this should be moisture only, not organic volatiles. In turn, the PAH content, as measured by the tolerant transmittance uh, ASTM D1618, should be between 80 and 98% transmission. This is depending on the process type, but also on the process conditions. If we have a result like that in the tolerant transmittance, we can chemically test uh, for benzoapyrene, which is the most nasty compound of uh, PAH. Uh, and we can test by a graph, uh, a gas chromatography and a mass practice to co uh, copy, um, for example, with an ISO 18287. What we want is less than 1 ppm benzoapyrene. Also, the group of the most eight common um, uh, PAH compounds with the same method should be below 8 ppm. We should have no contaminations like metal, uh, we should have no textile contamination, 
no crystalline silica and no zinc oxide. And as mentioned before, we should be milling to uh, D99 uh, of uh, 20 microns. And D99 means that 90% of the particles, 99% uh, of the particles are smaller than 20 micron. How do we measure this? There's an ISO test for it, uh, 13,320. Uh, this is measured by laser diffraction with the CLAS or Malvern Mar Master Sizer system. We have to bear in mind that these particle analysis um, thinks that the particles are spheric particles, but as we have seen with the normal carbon black, uh, also the shape of the recovered carbon black probably is not spherical. So this measurement is an approximate measurement. Now also we need to palletize the recovered carbon black. The palletizing is for convenience of handling, low dust handling, uh, also for better conveying in pneumatic uh, systems. And here it is important to have a pellet hardness, uh, which is not too soft because then the pellet will break up in transport and uh, the customer will just receive some powder. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard either because then it cannot be uh, broken up in uh, uh, the dispersion processes in polymers. In our case, we'll get to that. Uh, that might be um, either an internal mixer or that might be um, a twin screw extruder. And uh, if we don't disperse the recovered carbon black, we cannot get any color performance. Um, that counts for plastics as well for rubber processes. So let's look at the process choices. Um, very often uh, I'm asked the question, is a batch process better or continuous process? So let's look at both processes. Uh, before, let's look at the uh, little uh, chart at the top right corner, um, where I indicate the capex and the opex costs of typical processes. It's very small, but you can see the blue dots are European technologies. Uh, there's two red dots, which are Chinese technologies. Uh, there's the uh, American uh, flag. Uh, uh, for the American technologies, one British technology, and uh, there is uh, one Swiss technology. And what I can say is for the CapEx, I see the reasonable CapEx for Western technology is about 500 euros per ton of tire capacity. And a reasonable operating cost is below 200 euros per ton of tire capacity. So it's very difficult if uh, the capex is much more expensive than uh, the norm, then you have a high, uh, you have a need for very high quality um, recovered gum black and other products to have a good uh, business case. However, uh, I frequently recommend investors um, to increase the capex if you can reduce the opex. So a combination of a high capex and a low opex is a good strategy. Let's look at batch prolysis. So batch kilns are very uh, simple kilns and it can be very tight, uh, airtight, which is one of the, the problems of uh, continuous kilns. Um, they also can take whole tire feet. So uh, that is working on reducing the operational cost because we don't have to, uh, um, to uh, granulate the feet, uh, the tire feed stock, uh, so that it can be conveyed in the continuous systems. They're kind of difficult to scale up. Um, one example is uh, Pyrolix, and for the capacity of uh, th uh, 36,000 tons uh, of uh, tire feedstock, uh, they required 20 kilns. Uh, now they have an automatic feeding system, but uh, these are considerations uh, for large scale, probably a uh, continuous system is easier to set up and to scale up. Typically, the batch kiln has poor thermal efficiency because to unload the batch kiln, we need to cool down uh, to open the, uh, the kiln and uh, get out the uh, metal and raw recovered carbon black. Typically also, we talked about the char, typically the batch kiln is producing higher char or carbonaceous residue on the raw recovered carbon black. Now, in our case, for the coloring application, that could be a good thing. That could be a bonus. But uh, it is different in continuous kilns. Continuous prolysis kilns could be rotary kilns um, on, the, on the simple side. It could be auger uh, kilns. Very often, uh, there's multiple auger um, 
steps um, in in the uh, reactor. It could be a dripping bed uh, reactor. There's one company uh, which is uh, Pyrum that has a dripping bed uh, reactor with no moving parts. So there we can have a continuous system which is uh, really airtight, uh, which is a good advantage. Continuous uh, pyrolysis kilns are easy to scale up. Uh, they have a good energy efficiency. Um, however, as I said, typically they require a very small granulate feed. And typically there's tightness issues. You might have heard of uh, the fire at uh, Black Bear Carbon. Uh, that was hydrocarbon gas getting out uh, and meeting uh, hot surfaces and then uh, causing the, the fire. Uh, and this is not the only technology and the only company that had this uh, challenge. Typically also because in the continuous kiln we have a set temperature and we have a limited uh, residence time until the raw recovered carbon black leaves the reactor. Uh, typically uh, continuous pyrolysis tends to have high volatiles on the raw recovered carbon black. That could be for example 3%. Now let's look at some examples. In the batch kiln, uh, we have, for example, New Energy in Hungary. We have uh, Scandinavian and Virotech in Sweden. We have uh, Pyrolix in Germany and the US. And we have uh, Tireberth in Italy. Tireberth is a microwave system. You might know that uh, I quite like microwave systems for the uh, very efficient heat transfer and the very short reaction time. On the continuous uh, side, uh, we have clean industry with um, a plant in Poland. We have Boulder Industries uh, with a plant in the US. Your Aquafuels, again, a uh, plant in uh, Poland. Contact, also Poland. Pyrum, we mentioned before. Alpha Carbon, uh, plant in France. Uh, and we'll hear from Alpha Carbon in a moment. Rota Wave uh, is a semi microwave uh, process with um, a continuous uh, rotary kiln technology uh, in the UK and uh, Delta Energy, also a rotary kiln technology in the US. What is the recovered carbon black availability? Um, everybody is interested in recovered carbon black, uh, but how do the supplies look? And actually, the supplies look not as high as the potential demand. I reckon in Europe, uh, as of uh, 2020, pre-COVID scenario, uh, there could have been about 180,000 tons demand for uh, recovered carbon black. However, there is only 28,000 tons supply in Europe. And this supply, I uh, split into three quality categories. RCB1, which is the top quality, which is the type of quality of the specification I mentioned uh, a moment ago. There's only 10,000 tons available, and this is the wider Europe, including uh, countries like uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia, Belarus, Turkey. There is um, about four kilotons of an intermediate quality, maybe where the volatile specification is not met or several criteria are not met of the specification mentioned. And there's a big part, uh, more than half of it, of 14 um, kilotons, um, which are uh, raw, uh, it's raw quality, so it's unrefined. Probably the feedstock is not controlled. Probably um, uh, uh, there's uh, high volatiles. So this uh, quality, 14,000 tons, is uh, not usable for um, plastic applications. In China and India, we have higher availability. I reckon in India, there's maybe 30,000 uh, tons. In China, 50,000 tons. Uh, but then we would have to look at uh, which quality category uh, those might fall in. In Middle East Africa, uh, I reckon we have less than 5,000 tons availability. In the US, maybe about 10,000 tons, similar to Europe. Now let's look at plastic color concentrates. You might have heard uh, not about plastic color concentrates, but about compounds. So what is a compound? In the US, it's also called a pre-color. So it's a ready-made mixture which the converter can uh, put, for example, uh, into injection molding for producing a nice plastic uh, automotive mid console as uh, pictured in this slide. The compounder needs to uh, mix, uh, mix the uh, resin or several resins. Very often there's up to five, six resins in one compound. Um, for the black, he would uh, mix carbon black, of course. There also is white pigment in there, for example, for the uh, UV reflectance. 
Um, there might be other pigments to correct for the color, red and blue pigments. There might be antioxidants, there might be plasticizers, surfactants, UV stabilizers, anti-scratch agents, uh, and the list uh, continues. So this is quite complex and it's a little bit like a, a cook in the kitchen that is doing the recipe so that uh, uh, the, um, the meal is perfect. Here um, we want specific performance in automotive. We want the plastic to be scratch resistant, UV resistant, uh, the color needs to look nice and uh, it needs to be glossy and everything. When is the compound route used? So this is used for large volume demands. Typically in the European automotive plastics uh, ready-made compounds are used. Also the quality consistency because once you have the quality um, stable you can produce a large um, volume of the compound. However, once produced you cannot uh, correct the compound and also you cannot really adjust to small volumes. This is for the, the big volumes like used in the automotive industry. And one negative aspect is that you need a large storage for all these different uh, compounds. The second route to color is with concentrates. In Europe, this is called master batch. In, in the US, uh, it's called uh, concentrates or it's called color at press because the color is only added at the injection press uh, or it's also called natural plus. Here we have the master batch or color concentrate maker making a concentrate and then the converter is diluting that concentrate to the relevant concentration he needs with clear um, virgin polymer. And this is uh, much more flexible a system. Um, it could be used for medium vol uh, volume demand or even for small volume demand. Uh, it's used in the packaging industry. Um, now the automotive plastics in the US uh, is mainly going the uh, master batch route. And even if the master batch has some uh, quality issues, we can correct at the press by mixing another master batch and by correcting the dosing rate. Also, we can optimize the storage because we can store several um, master batches, uh, which don't take high volume, uh, and we take uh, and then uh, we store the clear polymer that can be used for any kind of uh, color for diluting to the uh, relevant composition. What kind of master batches are there? So there are single pigment dispersions. There's additive master batch, for example, and combi master batches. Keep in mind that master batch is not so much a product. It's much more a dis dispersion service because all these ingredients for plastics can only work if they are very well dispersed. And that is what the master batch company is delivering. In the single pigment dispersions, SPDs, um, there is, of course, a specialist for black, white, and color. Um, in, in the black um, um, single pigment uh, dispersions industry, we have uh, Cabot, we have Hubron, uh, also present in the webinar. We have modern dispersions present in the webinar. Uh, Citra, Premix, Compuestos, Kimpas, uh, Colloids, also present in the webinar. Cezanne, uh, uh, Chromex, uh, and we have megastars like uh, Schulman, Ampersat, Poly1, Clariant. Uh, we will hear about some of those uh, a bit later on. In the white area, uh, which is a titanium dioxide uh, concentrate, uh, we mainly have the mega stars, the big master batch companies like Ampersat, Schumann, Polyone, Clariant. And then, of course, there's um, the very fractioned uh, market of uh, color single pigment dispersions. We can have additive master batches, um, and the most common filler is uh, calcium carbonate. There's a concentration of these companies in Spain that do uh, calcium carbonate uh, uh, concentrates, uh, which are granic, compuestos, and plasper. And then, of course, we have um, additive master batches of anti-slip, anti-block, anti-UV, and all the, uh, the additives. The, the most complex master batch is a combi master batch. That is what I showed you um, for the automotive compound. There is uh, thousands of small color houses uh, everywhere in the world, very specialized uh, to the uh, local market. And the combi master batch inc can include, as I showed, uh, several pigments, several additives, um, or a combination of both several pigments and additives. And it could be, for example, the Coca-Cola red and polypropylene for crates. Let's look at 
resins because uh, also it's important uh, to understand what kind of plastic resin is important for the master batch. The most popular um, plastic resin is polyethylene uh, and this is on the back of uh, packaging films, shopping bags, garbage bags uh, and uh, uh, for low density polyethylene, high density could be bottles or toys. Uh, all these resins have different melting points uh, and they have a different melt viscosity or melt flow index. The second most popular is uh, polypropylene, uh, followed by polystyrene. Polypropylene could be furniture, car interiors, consumer carpet. Polystyrene uh, could be uh, vending cups or uh, disposable cutlery, uh, the kind of cutlery uh, people don't want to use anymore, which probably is good. Um, Polyester, uh, engineering plastic, uh, could be uh, soft drink and mineral water bottles, synthetic fibers for sports gear, for example. Polyamide, also engineering uh, plastic polymer, uh, is used as a metal replacement, furniture, um, automotive under the hood, and uh, office carpet. ABS uh, could be on your car bumper, uh, any exterior automotive trim, casings for electronic devices like your computer, um, um, and uh, for example, uh, Lego bricks. And then there is something called universal carrier. This is like a wax carrier. And normally, um, master batches uh, make the uh, um, color concentrate for the resin of the relevant end use application. So, if the end use application is, uh, for example, a low density poly, uh, polyethylene, uh, you need a master batch with that um, with that uh, resin. However, uh, you can use uh, universal carrier waxes. They can use uh, be used in uh, several um, end use resins. So uh, that is uh, more flexible um, in in the master batch um, market. Let's look at how master batches are produced. Uh, I mentioned internal mixes, but by far the twin screw extruder is the most common master batch uh, production technology. So you have the extruder, which is uh, depicted here. Uh, here I'm showing a picture from uh, Leistritz. Uh, you might have a feeder system. Now this is a small extruder, but in the large extruder you might have a pneumatic conveying uh, uh, of the uh, premix, uh, or you might have uh, several multiple feeds. Uh, the screw, as you can see in the middle of the slide, has different sections. The first section is for melting uh, the polymer. Um, then for dispersing the polymer with all the ingredients, uh, there might be uh, vents, uh, there might be open vents. At the end of the extrusion, there might be a vacuum vent to take out the uh, volatiles. So after the dispersion units, uh, there could be uh, distribution uh, screw elements. And at the end of the screw, we need to build up the pressure for the extrusion. Uh, then we might have a screen pack, which is like a sieve pack, uh, which is uh, straining for oversized particles. And the oversized particle, uh, they, they could be uh, really varying depending on the pigment. Generally, for standard plastics, we might use a 45 micron screen, which is screening everything above uh, 45 micron. For high performance uh, plastics, we might use 25 micron. This is already uh, getting into the... Um, uh, application of um, polypropylene fibers, for example, and this is the size of a white blocked cell, so very, very small. Um, synthetic fibers might even require 10 micron screening, which is the size of a red blood cell, very, very small. After the screen pack, uh, we might go into a water bath strand cooling, uh, and then uh, the uh, plastic is cooled and solidified but we need to dry the water off. We might have an air blade dryer, and then we need to cut the uh, strand into uh, uh, little pellets, cylinder-shaped uh, pellets, or if you have a water, a water bath uh, cool, uh, cutter, uh, also uh, underwater cutter, uh, we have more pellets uh, that are more shaped like uh, lentils. Now, for master batch, what we are looking for is color. So in our case, for recovered carbon black in master batches, we are looking for black color. It's important to know how to measure color. And uh, there is many color systems. Uh, color is uh, a very complex topic, but by far the most popular system is the seal up system. And uh, 
I have to say color and beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So a uh, color might depend on the eye, might depend on the machine. It depends certainly on the light source as well. Uh, you might have bought any uh, um, trouser or shirt uh, and in the artificial light of the shop it had a completely different color than in the natural light on the street. So um, typically in the color measurement for master batch um, people use um, generalized uh, standardized colors and that could be the uh, CD64 which is a um, uh, midday light artificial color source, uh, very defined. Now, um, the CLAP system has three properties. The L is the lightness, and it goes from 100%, which is white, to 0%, which is black. We'll look uh, at the black side, the dark side of the world, in the next slide. But let me explain first, the B axis is between the blue and the yellow, and the A axis is between the green and the red. And if A or B are close to zero, we're close to the L axis. And the visibility threshold for the delta B, so the difference between two um, B star measurements are 0.3. And then looking at the master batch, we have uh, several mechanisms. The light can engage with our pigments. That could be reflection, which is the case uh, in of titanium dioxide with a, uh, the highest refractive index of all materials. Uh, this is the reason titanium dioxide is used as a white pigment, because all the light is reflected. It could be absorption, which is the case of carbon black. So uh, we expect from carbon black and then also from recovered carbon black to absorb all the light and to appear black, because black is the absence of any light. And then we might have uh, scattering effects uh, when the light uh, comes on the particle and is scattered from that particle. One thing about coloring uh, differences, um, this is measured with a delta E and you see the formula on the uh, right hand side of the slide. Um, a color difference of delta E uh, equal to one is barely perceptible if the two colors don't touch. So if you have one color next to the, uh, the other, we can compare those colors um, more easily than if we look first at one color and then at another color. We'll test that in a moment. Then another thing which is very important is the metamorphism. Uh, and this is the color difference uh, under different light sources. Um, like I mentioned, natural light and the artificial light in, in the shop. Um, and um, the color consistency is very important for companies, uh, for example, in automotive plastics, um, that um, the car color or interior color looks the same under artificial light as uh, in the sunlight outside the, uh, the garage. Now let's look at the black side, the dark side of life. Uh, here we have the lower bottom of the color system. You can see the L axis in the middle. You can see the A axis uh, and the B axis. And I mark one point, which is a RAL color. You might know the RAL swatches. This is jet black, and jet black typically is regarded as the blackest black. Uh, and you can actually see, um, if your monitor is good, um, the uh, box, the black box on the right hand side, that is a uh, jet black color. A little hint, uh, if you want to simulate colors on PowerPoint, knowing that probably the uh, representation of that color on the screen might not be 100% because your monitor is not uh, calibrated. But if you want to get any color into PowerPoint or Excel or Word, um, convert the LIB um, coordinates to hex color because uh, you can uh, in, um, input the hex color in PowerPoint, Excel and Word. There's also the uh, red, um, green, and uh, blue system, but uh, we're not using that at the moment. So you can see uh, the L color of Jet Black RAL 9005 is pretty low. Uh, it's four, and uh, B is uh, really small, close to the axis, um, and A uh, is also close to the axis. B is slightly negative, so we have some aspect of uh, blueness. Generally, if we have an L star of smaller than five, we can say this is a black color. Everything above five is more a dark gray color. We'll have a look at that in a moment. And if we say L is um, smaller than five, we can say we have less than 1% light reflection. 
Now, if the L star is lower than one, we can say we have a deep black. Uh, we can have uh, uh, lower than 0.1% light reflection. This is the case for automotive top coat applications. And generally this deep black cannot be accomplished anymore by the standard furnace carbon black process, which makes all the rubber blacks and normal uh, uh, carbon blacks for plastic applications. Uh, but this is the gas black process, which produces very, very small particle sizes. We'll see uh, later on in the uh, presentation why this particle size is so important. Now let's look at the uh, RAL number 9005 jet black. Uh, this is a true, uh, rep or should be a true representation of uh, jet black. Uh, we've discussed the LAB values already. Now, if you compare with signal black, I go back and forth. You can see signal black is uh, much more gray, uh, much lighter. Um, as you can see, I highlighted the L star value of 17. It's much higher in the, uh, in the L axis. Now we go down and, and we look at shades. The shade is the redness or the greenness, blueness or yellowness of the black. And here we can say this is a black brown uh, because the A is close to two. L is eight, so it's pretty dark, uh, not really super dark, um, but this is the black brown RAL 8022. Now, uh, very often in, uh, in coloring applications, we don't really want the brown shade or the yellowish shade, which is uh, linked to uh, dirty, uh, some, some dirty aspects of the color. Uh, we want a clear um, and crispy blue. Uh, so the RAL 5004 is the black blue. You can see uh, the L is 11. Uh, so it's, let's say a dark gray, it's not a true black. Um, the A is pretty neutral, close to zero. Uh, but the B is a negative, which means blue. Uh, it's negative uh, by minus uh, seven, almost seven and a half. Now we got some sort of uh, grays, which is the traffic black 9017. Um, also, it's a gray because the L is uh, 16. Uh, a and B are pretty neutral. And we have the graphite black. Um, the graphite is a gray, right? Uh, it's not a black. Uh, L is 16. Um, the B is a bit more in the blue area, which is uh, minus 1.7. And uh, these are all the colors together. Um, and as I said, all the colors, if they're next to each other, uh, we can make out the differences much easier. And when you look at the black-blue, you can really see uh, the, uh, the blue tonality. Um, Black-brown is not looking very brownish, but if you compare it to black-blue, uh, you can see the difference. Signal black, um, quite light gray, uh, and jet black uh, is the only one of these um, uh, colors that is looking uh, really, really black. Now, um, this is all accomplished, of course, with carbon blacks. Um, I'm showing you this chart. It's a very busy chart. Probably I could have taken out some information, but uh, this is the carbon black uh, spectrum with some applications in plastics. And uh, there's two or three uh, key messages I want to uh, to con uh, convey to you uh, with that slide. Um, on the y-axis, we have the structure, which is uh, measured with the uh, oil adsorption of the carbon black. So the higher, the more structured is the carbon black. And uh, on the uh, x-axis, we have the standard thickness surface area, uh, which is the Bruno Emmer Teller um, nitrogen adsorption in a monolayer, just showing the external surface, not including the internal surface of the uh, micropores, mesopores. Now, what you can see is um, different ASTM carbon blacks that are the N numbers and the gray dots. Uh, and we have the semi-reinforcing, also called low color on the uh, uh, left-hand bottom. In the um, middle of uh, the chart, we have uh, medium color. This is uh, the rubber black uh, N330, for example, which is also called high abrasion furnace, a uh, half carbon black. Uh, then we have higher surface um, providing higher color. And the higher surface is a smaller particle. So here already uh, we can say a smaller particle has a higher color. Uh, we have the 200 range of uh, rubber blacks, which are on the plastics uh, side of the world, are called ISAF, Intermediate Super Abrasion Furnace. Or we can have the N100 type of rubber blacks, which are called uh, Super Abrasion Furnace. 
And um, you can see at the edges of this chart uh, the effect of going a higher structure, bigger particle or smaller particle. And one of the problems is if you go high color and then we have a high structure, we get high viscosity and we're limited in the loading. And then um, there is a couple of specialty blacks that have the high surface for the high color, but they have a low structure, which you can see at the bottom right uh, corner. Uh, this could be, for example, um, Bella Raven 2000, uh, which is used in automotive interiors or in uh, PET polyester bottle preforms. One interesting fact also is uh, we looked at the tonality. On the, on the screen of the different uh, blacks and grays, uh, there is also the undertone. Now the undertone is the tonality when you mix the black pigment with the white pigment, and, and then you get a certain shade. But it's totally different. And so while um, in the uh, mass tone or in the, um, in the um, uh, master batch, we have a blue tonality if uh, we have um, uh, smaller particles and high surface. In the undertone, if we mix, for example, a black and a white, uh, the bigger the carbon black particles are, the more blue uh, the, uh, the mixture of the color will look like. So let's look at types of black master batches. Uh, we talked about the uh, polymers um, and we have a combination uh, here of uh, the, all the polymers and the different carbon blacks. Uh, so we talked uh, about polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, which are polyolefin um, po uh, resins, for example, polyester, polyamide, um, or universal carrier uh, wax. And uh, on the carbon black side, we have low color, medium color, high color. We have a specific uh, high jet black, uh, carbon black. And then uh, we can go back a little bit um, on the right hand side of the height color would be a p-type, but the p-type is also pure, so it has a low pH, it's fit for um, food contact. And we'll get to that uh, in a moment as well. So this is summarizing all the different uh, combinations. Uh, we can see the tonality, and as mentioned, bigger particles, so semi-reinforcing or low color carbon blacks have a brown tonality, but in the tint uh, they get uh, a bluish undertone. And we have varying concentrations uh, that depends on the resin, but that depends also on the carbon black. Now, we have talked about recovered carbon black and we've talked about master batch. Uh, let's talk about recovered carbon black in master batch. And I want to give you uh, a couple of showcases of companies that already have developed recovered carbon black master batches. I think the first company to have recovered carbon black in master batches was Modern Dispersions in the US. They introduced on the uh, Plastics Fair K2016 in Dusseldorf. Um, they are 40% recovered carbon black master batch. Uh, it's also combined with a um, recycled carrier resin, so it's a 100% recycled product. I think that's very good to have a 100% recycled product. Um, the letdown ratio is 2 to 5% uh, applications, uh, all applications, including automotive and office furniture. Eco impact, um, so it saves oil and uh, it saves also, it lowers the carbon burden. Now, all this info is from modern dispersions, including the picture. Now we let, look at uh, the Reco Black 216 by Ampaset. Uh, Ampaset have a site in Tahut, and you might know that the pyrolysis company, uh, Pyrolix, has a site in Tahut as well. So. Uh, this is a, a collaboration between Ampaset and Parallax. It's a 40% recovered carbon black master batch. This time we have 95% recycled content. Uh, there might be some additives or it might be some virgin polymer added uh, to, to the mix. Uh, applications are stated general purpose industrial and consumer goods, packaging and flexible infrastructure applications. Eco impact, uh, oil saving of course, uh, and uh, carbon burden saving. Interestingly, Ampaset mentioned the combined use of Odder, uh, Odder Scavenger. Um, typically, if a master batch contains uh, post-consumer recycled uh, carrier resin, uh, it might have some odor because uh, there might have been some food packaging. And if we separate the food packaging from the rubbish, uh, there is still food in there. Typically, consumer recycled resins have some odor. Um, industrial recycled resins 
uh, might not have an order uh, that is coming, for example, from um, shrink wrap uh, uh, film, um, there, those tend to be uh, cleaner typically. Uh, so it's a smart idea to use an order scavengers to capture the, uh, the orders, uh, to mask the orders from the recycled polyethylene. Again, all info and the image from Ampersat. Now, Polyon also has a collaboration with Boulder Industries. And um, the uh, Uncolor RC Environmental Black by Polyon contains uh, Boulder Black. Uh, Boulder Black, to, as far as I know, is the only brand for recovered carbon black. I think this is very good uh, to bring uh, the uh, recovered carbon black product in the market and to position it at, at a very high value. Um, it's a range of carrier polymers. Um, this is very good because it gives flexibility and the applications. Applications uh, quoted are automotive, appliances, electronics, and office furniture. The eco impact, um, the RCB uses 90% less water and 61% less electric power and emits 90% less carbon dioxide. Um, regulatory aspects we will cover actually in the last slide of the presentation. But uh, I think it's good that uh, Poly1 mentioned uh, REACH compliance and ROSE compliance. Again, all info is from Poly1 and the image. Cabot also has a, a recovered carbon black master batch, uh, the Tech Black 85. Uh, this is interesting because it uh, contains reclaimed carbons. Uh, I would uh, say these are recovered carbon blacks. It also contains post-industrial carbon black. So this is out of specification carbon black, uh, which uh, cannot be sold, and which normally is being bled into normal carbon black at a very low rate of 1%. Um, but uh, if this can be used for a plastic master batch, uh, that's also a good application. And it contains recycled polymers. Uh, Cabot make no statement of uh, whether it's post-consumer or post-industrial. And there's a range of carrier polymers. Applications are quoted as compounding, injection molding, and non-critical film applications um, in industrial um, packaging and consumer markets. Again, all info is, and the uh, image is from Cabot. Then we get the RC Black range by Chromex. And I really like this because it's the full range of resins. It is uh, between 20 and 50% uh, concentration of the carbon black part in the uh, recovered carbon black. That, this is quite smart because uh, keep in mind that in the recovered carbon black we have an ash content and only the carbon black is a coloring component in the recovered carbon black. So Chromex specify not the total RCB content but specify the carbon black part in the, in the um, um, master batch. So the total recovered carbon black content is way uh, above uh, 20 to 50 percent. What I like also is um, it's almost a complete range in terms of the resins. Um, it's uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, styrene, uh, polyamide, ABS, uh, EVA and uh, PET, also called polyester. Um, these carrier resins are not recycled but on demand I think uh, Chromex would also make a, a hundred percent uh, recycled master batch of recycled uh, carbon black in recycled polymer. Applications, a long list uh, by, by resins, typical applications uh, for, for this kind of uh, resins. Uh, and again, all info and the image is from Chromex. Now let's go to testing uh, recovered carbon black master batch dispersion. And here I'm thankful for the data from Alpha Carbon and uh, the fact that they allowed me to show this data. We said that the color performance is very depending on the dispersion. And how do we test dispersion? There is a, an international standard for the uh, filter pressure value. Here we are extruding with a screen pack and we're measuring uh, not the um, particles that are on the screen pack in PPM, but we're measuring the counter pressure which increases, as you can see on the right-hand chart, which increases uh, with the amount of extruded master batch. This norm is the uh, DIN EN ISO 20, 000, uh, 23900 um, from last year, 2019. It formerly was the EN 13900 from 2005. What is very important because actually on the chart here you can see this is a failed screen pack test. But the interesting uh, information is here we have two carbon blacks, um, a half type 
N330 type of carbon black and a uh, recovered carbon black. And uh, both failed. And both failed. Why? Because the screen pack was very, very small. Actually, in that filter test, uh, the broadest, the biggest uh, kind of sieve uh, opening is 25 micron, which uh, you can recall from early on is already uh, used for high performance plastics. And then the screen pack two is even worse. It's less than that. It's 14 micron. And the screen pack three is 10 micron, which is used for synthetic fibers. So perhaps the recommendation here is a 45 micron screen pack is uh, best for the recovered carbon black master batches. Interestingly, um, if the um, filter pressure value is corrected, the recovered carbon black actually performs better than the uh, normal carbon black. So um, I hope that we can uh, repeat that test and do the, uh, the full processing of, uh, I think, 200 grams uh, master batch uh, again with those two carbon blacks. Uh, because I think um, actually that alpha carbon recovered carbon black has pretty good uh, dispersibility. Now, the application of films is very interesting for black master batch. And here, the haze or the opacity is uh, very important. And this can be measured by the ASTM method D1003. And we measure the haze and the luminous transmittance of extruded LDPE cast film. Uh, at 1% pigment addition and 50 microns film thickness, this has to be standardized so that we compare, uh, we can compare different films. Also here we can see on the left hand side, we can see the film with the recovered carbon black and the film with uh, the half carbon black, medium color carbon black. Uh, and the recovered carbon black is uh, pretty good. It's even slightly better than the medium color uh, carbon black. And the last is the color measurement. Uh, for the color measurement, uh, we injection mold uh, plates um, and they have about a four millimeter thickness. So we don't have any um, uh, transmittance of the, the color. We don't uh, go through this plate. Uh, and we measure the L star, A star, and the B star with a standardized D65 uh, light source. Um, and we see that actually between the recovered carbon black and the virgin carbon black, there's uh, virtually no difference in the L. Also, uh, the delta E just for A and B is very small, 0.2. Uh, it is uh, barely visible. This is a pretty good uh, result in extrusion dispersion, um, in uh, opacity for the film, and also in the color. Now, let's put that again into the um, slide we had seen early on, and let's compare how black this recovered black master badge really is. We can see it's not quite black um, because it is a gray pigment rather than a black pigment. The ash content, we could consider the ash as a white pigment. So it's a mixture of a black pigment and a white pigment. And this is because um, this particular recovered carbon black was made from European tire feedstock, furthermore, European car tire, PCR, passenger car radial uh, tire feedstock, which has a high uh, ash content because it has a high silica filler content in the tread. Um, the RCB has only 80% carbon black. Uh, also, I don't think it was milled very, very finely. I think there is uh, some improvements possible, uh, both on the feedstocks, uh, on the um, carbon black content, uh, but also on the milling. We're gonna see that in a moment. What kind of improvements can we do? So we talked mainly about increasing the carbon content, and there's three levels of feedstock control. So on the first and most simple level, we can control what type of tires goes into the prolysis. And we said that the passenger car tires have the silica content, truck tires have less silica content. So we could do actually a recovered carbon black for coloring, which is based on truck tires. At this point, whole truck tires. In the second level of precision, uh, we can analyze the tires with a thermogravimetical analysis, and we can determine what is the carbon content we get, what is the, uh, the ash content we get for the resulting recovered carbon black. And the best and most, uh, the deepest control is with XRF analysis, when we actually measure, and we can do that online, we measure online uh, each tire, 
how much silica uh, content and other inorganic content it has. Um, there is one recovered carbon black company, Black Bear Carbon, who has a patent for that. Uh, and uh, they analyze the tires as they go on the conveyor uh, to, to sorting. And um, you might know they have two ranges, one range uh, with, its, uh, with normal silica content and one range with low silica content, which of course will be better performing in coloring applications. Now, Black Bear uh, Carbon are specializing on paint applications, uh, but this kind of low silica uh, RCB would be nice for plastic applications as well. Of course, we can correct the ash content after the prolysis, but um, as a chemical engineer and process engineer, um, my experience is the, f uh, the earlier you correct for any kind of problems, the cheaper it is and the most efficient the method is. So um, there's an acid-based method for ash leaching, and depending on how much carbon content you, uh, you're happy with, um, if you want to have 98% carbon, um, you might add some 400 euros a variable OPEX cost uh, to, to the process. If you want to be 99.5 uh, and higher, uh, you're certainly adding 2,000 euros uh, per ton of the recovered uh, carbon black. And uh, also, uh, if you think about uh, the large volumes of recovered carbon black uh, in a typical plant, thousands of tons, uh, if you have to run all these through um, uh, an acid and uh, a caustic, um, th this is um, perhaps uh, has also some safety issues. There is a new method, a hydrothermal ash leaching. Hydrothermal meaning just with water and temperature. Um, it promises to be cheaper, about 200 euros per ton, uh, but that particular company is only a lab scale, and um, I find they first have to find uh, uh, they first have to prove the commercial viability for uh, you know thousands of ton uh, per year plant. The second stage of improvements for the recovered carbon black master batch is increasing the amount of the high color carbon blacks. So we need to see, uh, this is about the particle size and the microparticle size, um, where are high color carbon blacks? And these are predominantly in the truck tire tread. So this is just the tread which has um, N ASTM N100 or N200 range of carbon blacks. And they typically have uh, a uh, microparticle size between 20 and 30 nanometers. The smallest the furnace process can produce is 20 nanometers. Now let's move to the right hand side <clears throat> where I show the jetness uh, which is um, um, called MY. Um, and the jetness in function of the microparticle size of the carbon black. And the jetness is a measure for the, uh, the jet aspect. And there's a blackness as well. I won't go deep into the difference between the blackness and the jetness. There's a, this is uh, taken from a very nice article written by the carbon black maker Orion Engineered Carbons, uh, Black the Fine Details, in the European Coatings Journal uh, in May 2019, so quite recent. This is for coatings application, although you could argue it's a plastics application as well. It's a polyurethane coating. Now, I calculated, based on the equations in that article, I calculated the L star value so that we can relate, because we looked at L star and we said um, everything under 5 is black, um, everything under 1 is deep black, uh, and 0, which will never be accomplished, but 0 L would be uh, the super deep black. Um, and here we can see the um, different particle sizes, 51 nanometers, that could still be a furnace black, 25 nanometers as well, 20 nanometers. So 20 nanometers gets us to L star of uh, 0.16 in the polyurethane coating. Uh, let's keep that in mind. Uh, but everything lower than that, the 70 nanometers, 30 nanometers, and the 11 nanometers, these are from a different process. And the process is gas blacks. The gas blacks can produce uh, much smaller particles and we can get uh, lower than L.15. Uh, and these are the really super deep black carbon black uh, pigments. Of course, this is on the complete other side of the spectrum um, than we have with recovered carbon black. But keep in mind um, the possibility of having truck tread um, and making recovered carbon black just from truck tread will get us uh, into a particle size, micro particle size, 
of around 20 to 30 um, nanometers, which is good for the, uh, for the color and for the jetness. And then, of course, uh, we have to mill. We have to mill uh, very finely. Now, milling is not really going on the blackness. This is really the, the micro particle size, but the milling is more the uh, recovered carbon black aggregate size. But the aggregate size also plays on how we can disperse and how we can distribute the recovered carbon black in the master batch and in the final application. Here, I would recommend a milling below 10 microns. Let's look at the optimized recovered carbon black master batch. So we said feedstock is pure truck tread. Um, so we get an RCB with about 94% carbon black, which is very high. Uh, there's only 6% ash content or whatever, 5% uh, ash content and maybe 1% moisture. Um, this is milled to clearly below 10 micron. And uh, what it results into, we have 44% less reflectance. Keep in mind, black is about absorbing the color and white or gray is about reflecting the color so that we can see it. And you can see already uh, it is much darker. Uh, however, if we compare it on the left-hand side to the jet black, uh, we can see that still it, it is gray. It is a dark gray, but it is gray rather than black. Um, but you can see also um, there's a net improvement over the standard uh, high silica passenger car tire recovered carbon black. So I think this is a very nice result. I think this can be further tweaked, but um, just to show you a nice improvement. The last slide of my presentation is about regulatory aspects. And uh, the, the biggest or the most important is the food contact because uh, many of the um, plastics applications are in food contact or skin contact of any sort. Um, and there's different regulations in Europe and the US. And uh, there's a traffic light. You can see the EU food contact is possible. There is recovered carbon black manufacturers that actually give an opinion about the, the food contact and give green light. Um, the specification is uh, uh, in this slide. So the toluene extract needs to be uh, smaller than 0.1%. The cyclohexane extinction at 386 nanometers needs to be below 0.02 for the one centimeter cell or below 0.1 for the five centimeter cell. Benzoapyrin, the most nasty compound of the um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, needs to be below 0.25. Uh, ppm, milligram per kilogram is ppm, or 250 parts per billion. We might have microparticles between 10 and 300 nanometers, aggregates between 100 and 1,200 nanometers, which is 1.2 micron, and agglomerates uh, bigger than 300 nanometers. And um, some recovered carbon blacks would certainly fit that scheme. Uh, and we have a limitation to the addition. We can have maximum 2.5% weight of the carbon black in the final item. So this is green light, thumbs up. Uh, in America, um, the regulation is much more stringent and the FTA food contact is not yet possible. Um, in my opinion, I haven't seen any uh, recovered carbon black player that is fulfilling the uh, very string, uh, strict uh, requirements of FTA food contact. Um, the total pH content needs to be below 0.5 ppm. I think the best I've seen is uh, 1 ppm. Um, the benzoapyrin content needs to be lower than 5 parts per billion. This is super, super low and very, very difficult to achieve. Again, we have a limitation uh, for the maximum carbon black or recovered carbon black content in the final item. The third regulatory aspect is um, very often master batches require a declaration or the packaging customers of the master batch require a declaration that the master batch is heavy metal free. Uh, and this is uh, the European Directive uh, 9462 CE, Article 11, Paragraph 1, uh, and the relevant Annex 2. Um, and this is about the absence of chrome 6, lead, cadmium, and mercury. So thumbs up. You might have worried that um, in recovered carbon black, uh, we have zinc, which is a heavy metal. This is not considered in this directive, so thumbs up. However, 
um, zinc is subject to restrictions also to the uh, under this legislation and the zinc sulfide we need to make sure that the specific migration limit sml is uh, lower than uh, um, five milligram per kilogram so five ppm expressed as zinc so the zinc sulfide should not migrate out of our master batch or out of our plastic um, film or plastic uh, product Thank you very much. I will now go to the question and answer session. So you have um, communicated a number of questions in the comments and I will read them and answer one question after the other. Uh, Kane uh, from Orion Engineer Carbons is asking, um, with RCB, does anyone notice having to change screen packs more often? I would say uh, that the problem is that not every um, RCB is created uh, similar. Um, it depends on the feedstock, it depends on the milling, it depends on the refining. So um, if we don't mill to uh, uh, underneath 10 microns, uh, surely, and we, we screen with a, a screen over, uh, the, the milling size, um, we will have a pressure buildup and then we have to change the screens more often. So fine milling uh, is important. Um, Annie um, uh, from Graviki is asking, uh, what are some good RCB making companies in India? Uh, well, uh, I think in the audience there are some good RCB making companies. Uh, look at that slide uh, and look up uh, and contact those people uh, in India. Um, there is uh, good RCB makers in India. Um, again, uh, Ani, uh, does Cabot make recovered carbon black? No, Cabot is an integrated carbon black maker. They have a plastics unit called Cabot Plastics that is doing plastic master batches. Until last year, uh, they were only allowed to use Cabot carbon blacks. Now, uh, with the uh, recovered carbon black master batch, that's the first time they allow uh, non Cabot carbon blacks to end up uh, in, in the master batch. But no, they haven't integrated in recovered carbon black. I think uh, also they are the least likely to integrate into recovered carbon black. I see uh, Bella and Orion uh, more likely to, to make that step. But ultimately it will come. Uh, it's a question of scale and it's a question of uh, recovered carbon black quality and quality consistency. Um, then again, uh, Kane from Orion Engineered Carbons. Any chance uh, you know the MY value of these blacks? Uh, yes, remember remember that slide and uh, from the Orion Engineered Carbons article. Um, I don't have MY values for recovered carbon blacks, so that would be the next step, going one level deeper than this uh, webinar. Uh, you know, and spending some money with recovered carbon black producers to do uh, a really good color analysis, maybe a design of experiment. Um, how we can improve the color if uh, we turn certain knobs on feedstock control, process control, and uh, refining. Uh, I would uh, love to do that. Um, so, um, Annie uh, also is Recovered Complex such a great opportunity. Why Cabot Bella don't do this business? Just curious. Um, I replied it already. Um, it's a question of uh, scale, it's a question of quality, um, consistency, and of course, reliability and the trust uh, uh, those companies have in Recovered Carbon Black. Keep in mind, most of the Recovered Carbon Black makers are small startups uh, and they have only one site. Um, and for big companies like Cabot or any big customer like a tire company, uh, business continuity is uh, very important. And a uh, supplier that is single sourcing from one side uh, is always a little bit of a risk. Uh, I think it will come. Um, I, I think uh, tire makers will jump on recovered carbon black more and more. And uh, there will be more available volume as well in the next couple of years as we see recovered carbon black maker finishing their plant builds and uh, going to market. I'm working with quite a few clients on exactly that topic. Um, Annie again uh, from Graviki, uh, what do you think about advanced applications such as graphene and carbon nanotubes? Now, I personally haven't seen these kind of applications. I've seen a collaboration uh, for activated carbon, uh, but not graphene and carbon nanotubes. So I think that would be the, the next uh, step, maybe um, interesting application. 
Uh, I think uh, we'll have a question about conductive recovered carbon black uh, as well. This is connected because graphenes and carbon nanotubes certainly uh, are used for um, increasing conductivity in uh, polymer matrices. Then, Annie, again, uh, thanks for all these questions. Can recovered carbon black uh, be also used to make laser toners? Uh, honestly, I don't know. Um, I looked at uh, recycling uh, laser toner cartridges and the content of laser toner cartridges because they're never empty. When the uh, when the laser printer says they're empty, there's still some material in there. Uh, I think this is a super niche. I think these are super small particles. I think they're way smaller than anybody is milling, uh, but I would have to uh, to dig into that. Uh, also, these particles are surface treated. It's not just carbon black. Uh, this is also other uh, carbon, uh, sorry, other black pigments, not only carbon black. Uh, and they certainly are surface treated for their high performance. Uh, then Bob from uh, Rotorwave Scotland, um, Martin, if passenger car tires are high in silica and truck tires are lower, does it make more sense to process them separately? Yes, absolutely. As, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, that is the first uh, stage of um, controlling the feedstock and the second stage is uh, actual TGA me measurements or even XRF uh, measurements. Uh, with uh, X-ray uh, fluorescence to determine the the silica content, uh, but it would be a very good first step because um, you don't even need equipment uh, to tell a truck tire from a passenger car tire. Um, then uh, Alpha Carbon is asking, thank you, Martin. Lowering the RCB particle size may increase the melt index. Uh, what is a good compromise to efficiently process it? Um, I think uh, ultimately the processing conditions have to be uh, adapted. Um, but uh, what I see, um, I, I wouldn't see a, a strict correlation between the RCB particle size and the melt index. Um, I would see um, a correlation between the uh, carbon black structure and the melt index. So I think this has to be tested again, maybe with a design of experiment, uh, several um, tests and then do a uh, multi-regression on it to see what is the biggest effect on the, the melt flow index. Um, then Peng from Farrell, uh, can RC be used for conductive applications? That's a very nice question. I have, in my web shop, I have a report on um, conductive recovered carbon blacks. I can tell you uh, the market is very small. It's about 1% of the, uh, the total market for carbon blacks. And uh, so for recovered carbon black is super small. Uh, and of course, uh, we need to do very specific things. And the milling uh, alone and the palletizing is not sufficient. So we need to start with the feedstock control, the process control, um, and then milling. But we also need to take all, uh, out all the ash. We need to spend those 2,000 euros per ton of recovered carbon black to get to 995 plus percent of carbon uh, and then we need to activate we need to uh, go in with steam or carbon dioxide at high temperature and high pressure and crack open all the um, the pores in order to increase the the surface uh, so that uh, we get into the performance of conductive um, carbon blacks so yes it can be used but it's a big circus to achieve that i only know one company that is doing that and that is uh, Caltire. Uh, in Canada, uh, who is building a site in uh, Chile. Their feedstock is mining tires, uh, so it's a good starting point. But again, they need to do uh, uh, a really, really big process in order to get uh, the recovered carbon black to be conductive. Uh, conductive applications, I mean, there's uh, on the simple level and relevant to this webinar on plastic applications, uh, the simplest level of conductivity might be anti-static uh, master batch, which is uh, discharging the, the static, um, typically uh, built up by loading up uh, any, any polymer films. You might have seen f um, films clinging together that might be uh, static uh, electricity. Um, but uh, on the more exciting applications, these are battery applications for, um, for example, lithium-ion uh, batteries. We all depend with a mobile phone or the electric cars, we depend on the uh, batteries and on the uh, power and also the, the range of the, the batteries um, are limiting uh, the, uh, the range uh, of the utilization of the electric vehicles. So this is very, very, very exciting application and maybe Tesla could use RCP sometime in future. 
Now, Ravi from Capital Carbon India is asking, do master batch industry accept material in powder form or in pelletized form? I would say um, pellets are much easier to handle, certainly lower dust. Um, if you would discharge a big bag of powder, uh, recovered carbon black, you have a big cloud of carbon black. Uh, it's about the safety and, uh, and also env environmental aspects. Uh, so pellets are clearly um, preferred. However, uh, they shouldn't be too hard. So if you do the dry pellets, which is a bit more like a tablet pressing, uh, this might be too hard to be dispersed with the dispersive elements of a twin screw extruder. Francois from uh, Clean Carbon Conversion, uh, based on the current market size in the order of 5 to 20 kiloton a year, what do you think is the market cap or potential demand for RCB and plastics? Now, I haven't actually um, um, filtered down to RCB and plastics. Uh, I could because I have the customer list for Europe and uh, North America. Uh, I just have the, the total figures and I told you uh, European potential demand is 180,000 tons. Uh, now, admittedly, most of this is tire uh, and number two is rubber and only then comes the master batch industry. Uh, but there is th thousands of tons um, potential even in the plastics uh, industry. Uh, also knowing that the supply is much less than the demand. Uh, Kinan from Turkey, EcoSafe in Turkey. Um, can we produce uh, water-based carbon black from paralytic uh, carbon black? Now, probably you mean um, um, carbon black that can be used in water-based uh, paints or water dispersions. Um, this typically um, on the normal carbon black site, as well as the recovered carbon black site, would uh, require post-treatment. Um, and a normal carbon black is oxidized. And the recovered carbon black, we could do a gas treatment with ozone, which brings on uh, oxygen at the surface, which probably was detached in the um, in the pyrolysis process, because the um, uh, carbon blacks um, after the pyrolysis process, uh, some of the surface groups they just burned off uh, under the conditions of the pyrolysis process. So we bring back the oxygen, uh, we br bring back the oxygen hydrogen surface groups which are um, helping us to uh, get the uh, surface hydrophilic, so dispersible in water. Uh, Ravi from Capital Carbon, is there any difference in tin factor and powder and pellets of RCB? Uh, no, they shouldn't provide it that you can disperse the pellets as good as you can produce, uh, disperse the powder. So there shouldn't uh, really be uh, a difference. If you have uh, pellets too hard and you don't disperse, uh, you will certainly see the um, uh, lower tin factor, that, that's for sure. Uh, Kane from Orion Engineered Carbons, um, tin factor with powder and bead depends on the ability to disperse properly. Uh, that's just what I said. Martin discusses the powder uh, being needed for milling equipment that has less energy. Um, yeah, um, the, the milling plays a role and, and the pelletizing, of course. Uh, in the end, um, you need, in the end application, you need to disperse both carbon black and recovered carbon black appropriately so that you can have the color performance. Uh, Annie is saying, uh, we're trying that market, I think you mean the conductive uh, or the water-based um, coatings market and would love a webinar on that. Yeah, maybe I, uh, one of my next webinars, watch the space, could be about uh, uh, inks, water-based inks and water-based uh, coatings. It's a very tiny market though, so maybe there's not a lot of people who want to know that uh, apart from you, Annie, uh, and some paint makers. Um, Ravi from Capital Carbon, Martin, for pelletization, what is the best binder for plastic uses? So um, the binders used in carbon black tend to be molasses, so sugars, uh, waste uh, from the sugar industry, or lignosulfonates. Um, added at a faint concentration, I think below 1%. I don't remember the exact percentage. Um, I have heard of recovered carbon blacks that didn't need any binder for making pellets that has really very, have really nice uh, pellet um, and uh, also the pellet hardness without any binder. So I would say it depends, but the um, starting point would be molasses and lignosulfonates. 
Uh, Bob from Rotorwave, um, what do master batches think of recovered calm black versus virgin calm black? Uh, I think with that webinar, I could show you there's at least five of them that already have um, recovered calm black master batches. Uh, they see it as an echo product. Um, and we all know we consumers, uh, it's more important, uh, more and more important for us um, to have um, sustainable materials. Uh, we also know that um, there's a lot of plastics bashing going on uh, where plastics in many cases are the most environmentally sustainable solution. Uh, the problem is the behavior of the consumer, what they do um, after the end of uh, the, uh, after the end of life of the plastics product, um, does it go into recycling or doesn't it go? So I think uh, master batches see the opportunity and I've been told by some of the master batches who don't have a recovered carbon black master batch that they surely want to, uh, to make such a product. So I think all doors open to that product. However, um, the product needs to perform. Uh, that is clear. It needs to provide uh, color. Uh, it needs to be dispersible. Uh, it shouldn't contain any nasty stuff like uh, PAH uh, or um, crystalline silica. Uh, so we have to engineer a good product for those uh, coloring applications and the master batch companies. Francois again from Clean Carbon Conversion. Do you have any data regarding the ash composition affecting the performance of the recovered carbon black? Are there specific chemicals, ashes, metal salts which affect the performance severely? Now, uh, bear in mind that in plastics and the master batch, um, our primary goal is coloring and tinting. Um, and the ash, as I said, is more of a white pigment than the black pigment. Uh, we have already mentioned uh, we want as little ash as possible. Um, but within the total ash component, uh, I would say the components that have less white aspects, less refractive index, uh, they are better. Uh, so the less refractive index uh, the ash uh, uh, composition has, the better. Um, but actually, I don't have data, so this is an estimate from my side. Uh, Giovanni uh, Michetti from uh, Boulder and Kylos Master Batch. Does Recovered Carbon Black have some UV protection as virgin carbon? Uh, yes, it does. And uh, I've seen some mentioning in uh, the applications for Recovered Carbon Black Master Batches in pipe. Um, some pipe applications, the pipes are extruded and then they're just put outside uh, and they're exposed to sunlight uh, and it can be weeks before they're being put underground. And uh, in that case, they need a UV protection. Uh, I think there's also a, um, specific standards by um, pipe manufacturing associations. Um, but basically, UV protection is the same as black color because uh, what we want is the carbon black and the recovered carbon black to absorb uh, UV radiation. Um, so the higher the carbon content is and the smaller the particle is, uh, the, the better is the uh, UV protection. Also, again, uh, same as for the color, uh, the dispersion and the, um, and the particle size, which allows us to have a better dispersion and uh, better distribution throughout the uh, plastic part uh, that can help. Um, Ravi from Capital Carbon, does sulfur present in recovered carbon black affect in any way the plastic master batch performance? I have not heard. Um, as long as it is non-leachable and stays within the plastic matrix, I think uh, it is not a big problem. But I would um, put that question to the master batch companies and, and make sure that they don't have any, any problem with the sulfur com uh, com um, content. Vishesh uh, from uh, Finster Carbon, is there any proven technology supplier for acid base leaching or hydrothermal ash leaching? Uh, I don't think uh, this is, uh, has gotten out of uh, the academic uh, laboratory area yet. Um, there's a number of um, academic articles on acid base leaching. Um, I think uh, Caltire have developed that for the conductive recovered carbon black. Uh, I haven't seen the build of Caltire in Chile, and of course they're slowed down because Chile is not only in the, in the COVID-19 crisis, but they're also uh, close to a civil war uh, because of the um, uh, social differences uh, in the uh, Chilean um, population. So they're slowed down in their, in their build. Um, the hydrothermal ash leaching is really only at kilogram stage at the moment. 
Um, it's quite promising. I'd like to see it. Uh, but uh, they need to prove the commercial viability for 1,000 tons or 10,000 tons. Um, Vishes again, does air gravity separation cyclone work to reduce grid level? Um, now, this would be an interesting thing if you mill fine enough, uh, whether you could separate actually uh, grit and ash and uh, separate uh, those from the recovered carbon black. That would be a very nice uh, research uh, project. Uh, Peng, uh, I think I had that question already. Can RCB be used for conductive application? Yes, um, exciting application, but the market is very small, as we said. Uh, Derek uh, from Colloids, do you have any data on functional groups on the C uh, carbon black surface and how this compares with standard furnace carbon black? Uh, I don't. Um, my information is, I, I personally don't, but my information is that um, many of the surface groups are actually uh, being burnt off under the uh, pyrolysis uh, uh, conditions. Um, however, I would recommend reading an academic article by Christian Roy, which is something like um, energy sites of carbon blacks and recovered carbon blacks. Um, and measuring the specific surface energy, not the surface groups, but the surface energy uh, of the different types of carbon, which are both on the recovered carbon black and the normal carbon black. Um, and he might have something on, um, on the functional groups as well. Um, Derek, again, can you circulate all heavy metals? You mentioned uh, uh, 10, uh, 2011, but not the norm EN713. Um, regarding barium, uh, chromium-3, lead, and organotins. Um, no, I haven't uh, mentioned that because uh, I see a lot the um, the heavy metal um, being specified in master batches uh, and the norm I quoted. Uh, this other norm, I personally don't know. Um, but um, starting from the composition of rubber compounds in the tire, um, you have very little barium, uh, chromium-3, uh, lead, and organotins, uh, and this is what we recover. So uh, personally, I wouldn't see uh, a problem for fulfilling that norm as well. Of course, that has to be uh, tested, that has to be analyzed. Um, and the last question also from Derek, uh, do you have data that you can share uh, about the carbon dioxide savings from using RCB? Now, I quoted uh, the master batch companies and the carbon dioxide saving um, they advertise. Um, you might understand that um, the carbon dioxide burden of the recovered carbon black also depends on the thermal efficiency of the process. So what I see, if you have a batch discontinuous process, uh, I see values of uh, 0.4 tons carbon per ton of recovered carbon black, which is already two tons less than the, the virgin carbon black. Um, and I see 0.2 tons of carbon dioxide burden uh, in the case of continuous processes. And um, I have a third figure, uh, which is, I think, uh, 1.2 tons carbon per ton of recovered carbon black for a double prolysis. Um, this is uh, when you have two kilns um, after uh, one after the other. Uh, in order to get a really, really dry recovered carbon black with a very, very low pH uh, content. And of course, if you have two times the prolysis, um, you need to heat up two times and you're creating a little bit more um, carbon dioxide. Still, uh, still uh, uh, half of the carbon burden of virgin carbon black. So um, I'm wrapping up the question uh, and answer session. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And uh, I hope you join me on my next webinars. If you have any more questions or if you think I can help you with my expert consulting on Recovery Come Black, please give me a call. Uh, it will be a pleasure to work with you. Thank you very much.